important. Um, yeah, I know that there's definitely people who were told me they were interested, they couldn't be here at noon. So um, this gives them an opportunity to see that as well. Um, all right, yeah, so I guess I will turn it over to you, Matt, to um, introduce this package. And um, yeah, I'm excited. And I put the link in the chat uh, for anyone to the GitHub where you can download the script that um, Matt's going to use today. I realize if people come in later, I don't think you see the earlier chats, and so I can um, post it again later. If any of you need it, just message me, um, and I can um, do that again. But uh, yeah, take it away, Matt. Uh, great. Yeah. <clears throat> so today I'm going to be going over the package landscape metrics, which was sort of designed as a drop in replacement for frag stats um, so that you can do those types of GIS operations in R. Um, let me share my screen. You guys see that? All right. <clears throat> So if you're not familiar with what FragStats does, um, it's basically a landscape ecology tool for measuring a whole bunch of different characteristics of the landscape based on categorical data of some sort, typically like land cover data. Um, <clears throat> the landscape metrics package uh, takes <clears throat> raster objects as an input um, so it'd probably be used in conjunction with uh, the package raster if you don't already have that data prepared in that way. <clears throat> and it takes raster layers, stacks, bricks, and lists of layers as input arguments. <clears throat> and then um, it's usable in a tidy workflow. It always uh, takes um, the input raster data as the first argument, and it always outputs uh, a tibble. So it can be used in a piped workflow uh, environment. It calculates um, metrics at uh, three uh, scales of interest. So it's got a number of metrics for the patch level. Uh, it's got a number of metrics for the class level. So if you want to calculate uh, a metric for like all grassland pixels or all uh, forest pixels, and then it also uh, has a set of metrics for the entire landscape, so the entire raster with all classes present. <clears throat> there, it does a whole bunch of different stuff. Um, it's sort of a, a kitchen sink uh, type list um, in landscape ecology. There's lots and lots of different ways to measure a landscape. And this uh, attempts to incorporate all of the ones that are used uh, most commonly. Um, so it does um, sort of very, very common things like calculate patch areas and core areas and distance to uh, distances between patches as, uh, as nearest neighbors. And then it does some more, um, some things that I'm not as familiar with anyway, like uh, fractal dimension indexes and clumpiness indexes. Um, if, uh, if you want to calculate some sort of landscape metric that has been published or uh, appears in frag stats, landscape metrics can probably do it. <clears throat> so when you're using it, um, you need to keep in mind that it's going to assume that the input raster has a one meter pixel. If you're doing a really large landscape um, and you need a different resolution, you're just going to need to keep that in mind that you're going to have to do some calculations on the back end because it's always going to report either in meters, square meters, or hectares. <clears throat> and then, it, so if your input raster is at a different scale, you'll need to rescale the output as well. And there are some uh, utility functions, which we'll go over. Um, like if you're not sure if your raster um, is appropriately formatted, you can use the check landscape uh, function um, to, to see if it meets the requirements. And then the output's gonna look something like this. Um, no matter what metric you ask for, it'll always be structured like this so that um, you can calculate multiple metrics at the same time and 
uh, out, you know, join them together in the tables. Uh, it's all compatible with each other. Um, so I'm just going to go through um, some of the material uh, presented in a couple of different vignettes uh, on the package. Um, and I guess if anybody has any questions before I get started on that, I can talk about that. Thank you all to be able to unmute yourself if you have questions. I think you're probably all muted now, but feel free to jump in and ask. Yeah, and feel free to interrupt me if uh, if you have a question or if I'm not being clear about something. <clears throat> so we'll just run through this. We'll load our libraries. Is that um, reasonably visible to everybody? The fonts okay and everything? Okay. I, I can see it I, um, and I think it looks okay. I could imagine it might be a little small if someone has a smaller screen. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that looks good. Cool. Thank you. So if you're if you're looking for a particular metric and you just need the, to know what the function for it is, or if you're shopping around to see uh, what metrics might be useful to you, um, you can uh, use the list uh, LSM list landscape metric uh, function, and it'll tell you everything that it is uh, capable of calculating. Either um, so, this is just like um, the <clears throat> the abbreviated name of the metric, which is going to appear in the function name. Um, it fully spelled out. Uh, name of the metric sort of making them categorical like uh, is it measuring a shape is it measuring aggregation is it uh, looking at, at like edginess um, and then the level at which it's functioning um, so the patch level the class level and then there should be some on the landscape level as well So if you're not sure where to start, that's a good uh, a good place. Um, <clears throat> you can also, if you want to narrow down the list, 130 something uh, functions is kind of a lot to look through. You can also filter it based on some um, characteristics, uh, the level, uh, if you know what type of metric it is, um, and then you can get sort of a full output or, or an abbreviated output from that. So when you're getting started uh, on your analysis or your exploration, um, first we're gonna just kind of check to make sure that things uh, are gonna run okay with your raster. That's like the foundation underneath all of this is having your raster correctly prepared. Um, and that, um, at least in my workflow, that would be the subject of an entire another talk, um, kind of getting stuff out of GIS and into R and making sure it's all uh, playing nicely. So we're going to load uh, just one of the example uh, landscapes that comes with the package. It's called Landscape, and it's uh, sort of a small uh, 30 by 30 um, chunk of area with three different uh, land cover classes. And we are going to we can run our diagnostic check landscape function on it to uh, make sure that it's compatible and uh, Strangely enough, even though it's the example that they provide, it is not 100% uh, compatible. Uh, it gives us uh, a warning about the coordinate reference system because uh, they've sort of got it um, as, a, as a generic uh, reference system instead of sort of a real world one, I guess. Um, it's still gonna do all the things that, that uh, we need it to, but if you got a warning like this on your landscape, you definitely wanna run down what the issue was. Um, so once you've got your raster set up, uh, ready to go, validated that it works correctly, then calculating the uh, metrics is really pretty straightforward. So all the metrics are going to have this LSM, which is landscape metrics, the scale at which it is, patch class or landscape, and then the abbreviation um, for the name of the metric you want to calculate. And so for this one, we're going to calculate the Euclidean nearest neighbor distance uh, at the patch level. And so that's what the Tibble output looks like. If you want to uh, 
look at it in the viewer. <clears throat> it's going to give us one nearest neighbor, um, and the output is going to be in the value column. And again, so the outputs are always going to be in meters, square meters, or hectares. So because we're asking for a distance, this is always going to be in meters. Um, so the ID is the patch number. So for patch number one through nine in the first land cover class, um, that would be this uh, like burgundy or dark purple color. Um, we have a nearest neighbor um, for each one of those patches. Um, then similarly for the next land cover class, uh, we've got a series of patches for that and the nearest neighbors for those and so on. So similarly, um, if we want to calculate the total area, um, this is something that you could do in the um, raster package alone. Yeah, my, sorry, the cords are loose on my monitor and they flicker in and out sometimes. What's it going to do? That happens to me too. Work from home challenges. I guess you're at school, but. <laughs> yeah. All right, is that back now? Okay. Uh, so calculating total area is something you could do with other packages, but it's nicely integrated uh, into this. Um, so this one is just going to be, since it, you're asking for it at the landscape level, a total area, um, it's just going to give you one, one number. Um, so this is going to be in hectares. 0.09 hectares for the entire uh, 30 by 30 um, landscape that we've given it. Um, and then if we wanted to add, this would be like a total edge uh, by class. Oh man. Sorry about that. Uh, let me just turn off one of my monitors. All right, hopefully that fixes that. So calculating total edge um, on the class uh, by class. So we've got our three classes, one, two, and three. And uh, because it's a raster, they're always going to be numerical, one, two, and three. So somewhere you're going to need a key that tells you what the class numbers are. And that would be something you would develop um, while you're um, making your raster. Um, and then sort of a total area in uh, square meters this time for each class. Or I'm sorry, uh, we're, we asked it for edge. So um, total length of edge um, for each of those land cover classes. Here's an example of how these uh, can be integrated in a tidy workflow. They can be, can be piped. So um, we're going to uh, filter. Uh, we, we only want uh, patches. So um, we're asking for a patch Euclidean nearest neighbor, but we're only interested in class two and ones that have nearest neighbors that are further than two and a half meters away. And, uh, and we're interested in what the IDs are for those. Cool question. Is there a reason that you needed to use dplyr ahead of that? Is there like some, the filter also occur in one of these packages or something? No, that's just the way it's written in the vignette. I assume that's just sort of for best practices because they don't know what else you're going to have loaded. I would okay. Guess. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, I can't. I can't think of a conflict. Raster might have a filter command in it, uh, but uh, landscape metrics doesn't. Um, so because we're only asking for the IDs, it's going to output a list of a list of the um, patch numbers um, of class two that have a Euclidean nearest neighbor distance of more than two and a half. Um, you could also um, then stick together uh, outputs from different metrics. Um, so here we're asking for CAI, I'm not sure what that one is, uh, an inscribing circle and in, uh, Euclidean nearest neighbors. And bind the results together. So you can have all of your outputs in a, a single table. 
So some caveats on that. You'll need to know, uh, you know, that the values may be different depending on what you're asking it for. If you ask for one of them, that's a, that's a distance. It's gonna, this is going to be meters. If you ask for one of it, that's area. It'll be either square meters or hectares. So um, just be careful about that. And then you can also um, ask it for more information um, when you're sticking it together um, and get sort of a more complete output as well. And that'll have some hints as to what the value is. So these ones are areas, um, whereas like the Euclidean nearest neighbor would have been a distance. So that's the basic functionality of the of the package it's it's appears fairly straightforward again i'm going to say a lot of the work is just in getting your raster set up um does anybody have any uh questions uh so far about that before i go into some sort of the more utility type things that it can do matt yeah i think um I think when you're talking about units of measurements, you're talking about the units of measurement on the X and Y. So they could be in meter UTM meters or they could be in UTM kilometers. So I think that's where the meter comes from. You know, as your, you know, I don't think it's the pixel size so much as uh, is the unit of measurement. Uh, sure, yeah, um, so, if your input is in meters, then the output will be in meters or square meters or whatever. Right. So if you um, had pixel sizes of 100 uh, square meters or, or, or 100 meters by 100 meters, then you would just need to apply that um, uh, correction factor uh, through. So assuming- I, I'm, I'm not sure that's correct, Matt. I think- if, if your measurements are in meters, that's fine. So you can have 30 meter pixels, but you would still get the right information in frag stats. But if your measurements are in kilometers, so instead of zero to 30 meters across this X axis in your example, it was 30 to zero to 30 kilometers. That would, that's where I think the issue comes from. Okay, so yeah, it may, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying that um, if the coordinate reference system is correct, then it does not matter uh, what your pixel size is? I think that's correct. Okay. You know, we should check that, but I'm pretty sure it's the coordinate system metrics, not the pixel size metrics that's, that are, that's the issue. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Um, so I guess I'll just caveat that with, um, it does clearly state that the output is always in meters, square meters and hectares, um, but you probably just want to double check it on your own data to make sure it looks like what you expect it to. Exactly. So Any Matt, questions or comments? So Matt, does this use the same coordinate reference systems that come out of RGDAL? Um, that SP and SF use? Yes. Because um, you, you had that set to missing and one could presumably set the coordinate reference system if, if you wanted to. Yeah. Um, and so I noticed, uh, I recently went through and updated um, from R version 3 point something to the newest 4.0.3 and um, somewhere in there, the package updates changed the way the um, coordinate reference system arguments work. I guess just as an aside, um, they seem a little bit more user friendly now. Um, and I think the ones that I ended up using, I think I ended up importing my rasters through uh, RGDAL uh, package, I believe. Right, which would be the standard way for manipulating um, all that spatial detail. Um, and in case folks aren't aware, the update from three something, probably 3.6 to R4 point something 
is a major update. So I would not recommend doing it uh, if you have a, a, something that's due within the next week <laughs> because it can break a bunch of different things. Yeah, so I've largely, um, so I've picked up my, uh, my spatial analysis after uh, not working on it for a while and I'm using the opportunity to update R and all of my packages and then we're working through it line by line to make sure it still works the way it's supposed to. And that was one of the major changes I noticed. I, uh, in shutting off my second monitor, I seem to have uh, lost my participant video. So just know that I can't see you, but uh, speak up if you have a question. Sounds good, thanks. Um, <clears throat> So I'm gonna just go through some of the utility functions, um, which are kind of some of the nitty gritty about um, some of the important functions that you're gonna need if you want to um, run a, a sort of a detailed analysis. Um, I did wanna point out that there are some other um, sort of example landscapes uh, available that are um, more real world, so We've got uh, a land cover map of Augusta, Georgia, I believe, uh, based on the National Land Cover data set. And this one's got like mm, a whole bunch of potential land covers. I think it's like 60 or 90 land covers that could be um, uh, in this landscape, not that they are all there. And then we've got our, um, our simplified landscape as well, um, which for some of these things um, for processing time using the simplified one is uh, maybe better for examples. So checking to make sure that the, um, the patch delineation behavior is what you expect it to be uh, is gonna be a good idea. Um, so you can use the show packages uh, function to, um, to get a visual on how uh, landscape metrics is breaking uh, the patches to make sure that it's operating like you expect it will. So for instance, um, this one, we're using the Queens case um, linkages so that it will link on uh, corners in addition to edges. So this big central patch all ends up being the same patch as denoted by it being uh, the same color there. Um, so if you want it, to do something different, um, you can you can change to uh, to Rook's case instead of Queen's case in that particular example. Um, the show patches um, will also uh, sort of give you a uh, a paneled view based on land cover classes. So for class one, it looks like we've got maybe I think this one had like nine patches in it and land cover class two and three on three and that's you know that would be your matrix in iowa that would be corner bean fields or whatever and they all have a little bit of linkage or almost all looks like there's uh, maybe two patches there um so you can use that to check yourself to make sure that your uh landscape looks like you think it should um, if you're interested in in core areas versus edge areas you can also use this show cores command um, which will show you um, sort of the pixels that have exposures to edges of differing um, land cover classes and ones that are uh, totally surrounded by pixels of their same, uh, same land cover class. And then you can um, get a visual representation of whatever uh, landscape metric you're asking for using uh, show landscape metric. Um, so on this one, we're gonna ask it for patch area. And this will output uh, a raster uh, where the pixel value is equal to the patch area. So with the um, darker colored pixels being smaller patch sizes and the uh, lighter colored pixels being larger patch sizes.
So those are just some uh, visualizations which you might use um, as uh, to check your inputs or to check your outputs uh, to make sure that they uh, seem reasonable or to share your examples uh, or to share your results. Um, on all of these landscape metrics, measurements, um, correlation um, should be something that you keep in mind because while there's 132 different ways to measure your landscape, lots of those are going to have strong correlations and you may want to consider that if you're going to be including multiple metrics in a single analysis. Um, so uh, it comes with a, a function for um, calculating the correlations. So first we're going to um, calculate, we're going to use the calculate LSM uh, function, which I believe just calculates uh, all, all metrics at the uh, requested scale. Um, yeah, so because we didn't give it the metric argument, it's just going to give us all of them at the patch scale. Uh, and we can see that here. So it's got 324 outputs of, uh, of a variety of patch um, metrics, starting with area. So then we can use that uh, to visualize the correlations uh, between all of those different measurements. So it looks like we got uh, about a dozen uh, patch level measurements. Um, and you can, you can see that many of these are, are uh, pretty strongly correlated um, with the lighter colors um, or the more faded colors being uh, closer to being uncorrelated. Um, so that's something that uh, may be of use to you um, while you're considering what landscape metrics you want to use. Uh, so now we're going to talk about this get patches uh, function. Uh, this function is heavily used um, behind the scenes um, for most of these calculations. Um, it's going to do an internal call to the get patches function in order to delineate um, what the patches are, which I, I discussed briefly before. But um, so I actually found that this was a stumbling block for me when I was setting up my analysis. Um, it took me longer than I care to admit to realize that this get patches function uh, was a simple answer to the question of linking your input data to your output data. So um, I do stuff with nest survival and I want to have landscape metrics calculated for um, a number of points for nests, but then I need to know what patches each nest is in. And um, without using this get, get patches command, um, that ends up being kind of convoluted. Um, so this is uh, fairly important um, for, for linking your um, object of interest or locations of interest um, to the outputs. So if you call it, um, it's going to tell us that it has made some raster layers. Uh, we've got three of them, um, and it's going to give us some information about them. You can uh, restrict the uh, the Git patches to just a particular class. Um, so now we've only got a single raster of uh, of class one, and then you can use that show landscape command if you want to visualize it. Um, so this is the um, example landscape that we've been using, and we are asking it for the patch numbers, what the patches are named internally um, for all of the class one land covers. So each one of these different colors is a different patch, and they each have a different numerical name. Um, you could then take this uh, raster with numerical patch numbers and essentially do a join with your point data or whatever you, ever you have to, 
to pull the patch number out for every um, location of interest. So uh, using a more uh, realistic uh, landscape, we're gonna go back to the uh, Augusta National Land Cover data set. And we're gonna ask for all of the patches of land cover class 90. Um, I didn't find any documentation that came with this that told me what land cover class 90 actually is. It's wetland type. But it looks yeah. like some sort of water related. So yeah, wetland, great. Um, so you can see that it has um, colored the different patches. And so, you know, all of these are the same color or maybe this is one color and this is another color. The reason why it looks like there might be gaps between them is just sort of a scaling issue. If you zoomed way in on this, um, it would draw in um, the pixels that you can't quite see at this resolution. And you can see why they're, um, you know, some of these ones with sort of tenuous linkages are considered the same patch. Uh, so moving on to the next sort of utility function, um, if you want to know uh, what land cover classes um, are near or related to other land cover classes, uh, spatially related, you can calculate adjacencies. Um, so this is going to be our land cover classes one, two, and three, and this is going to tell us um, basically the number of shared pixel edges between them. Um, so uh three to three two to three one to three uh the number of um adjacencies and if you wanted to know if, if you had some sort of directionality in your land cover like maybe water flow or something like that and you and you were only interested in adjacencies um uh, in particular directions um you can specify your own matrix um with uh, which adjacencies to consider. So for this one, we're only interested in diagonal linkages. So we've saved this as, uh, as um, an input argument. And then it'll just give us the, um, the diagonal adjacencies. So then we've got uh, a nearest neighbor uh, function. So we're gonna take our landscape. We're gonna ask it only for class one. Uh, we're gonna save that raster as patches. We're gonna look at it, see that yes, indeed, this is our class one and all of the different um, patches. And then we're going to ask for the nearest neighbor for each patch. And this is going to be just each patch within that land cover class. And so this will be um, the distance between each patch. So the ID numbers of the numerical uh, patch name and um, how, how uh, far away their nearest neighbor is. Um, so if you didn't care what the nearest neighbor was, you only wanted the nearest, um, that would be um, of use. Uh, you can get circumscribing circles, which is um, something that uh, I haven't used in my work yet, um, but sort of similarly, uh, you can use the get circumscribing circle um, for a particular class. And then it's gonna output um, uh, an X, Y, and I assume that this is radius that describes the circumscribing circle um, that encompasses each patch. So this is another sort of measure of size and shape combined um, where what is the smallest circle that can be drawn that encompasses the entire patch. So it's going to give you an X, a Y, uh, and a radius. So that's what I've got for the vignettes. Um, I guess I'll just reiterate in my in my own analysis this uh, as far as the utility functions go. This get patches 
is uh, critical, and it's kind of hard to do stuff without it. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, uh, the actually just calling calling the uh, landscape metrics is pretty straightforward, um, assuming that you've got your raster set up correctly. So that's what I uh, had prepared to go through. I'd be happy to um, entertain questions or comments. Hey Matt, I'm, I'm curious what your, if you've used frag sets before and what your take is on the comparison of the two. Ah, uh, good question. So I, I'm now in year five of my PhD and I've known for a while that I was going to have to learn frag stats and I kept putting it off and putting it off and I put it off long enough that somebody wrote an R package to do it instead. Uh, so I actually don't have much direct experience with frag stats. Um, in some of the documentation, the author does provide um, some like benchmarks and comparisons between the two, uh, which seem mostly targeted at showing that it is indeed doing exactly the same thing that frag stats does. Um, as far as just sort of uh, the difference between using them, I think that's just gonna come down to user as to how comfortable you are um, with uh, ArcGIS and automating functions in GIS versus doing it in R. Uh, Alder, I found my workflow was a lot easier when I start, when I converted over to landscape metrics from frag stats. You know, it took me like four or five different things. I had to write R scripts and Python scripts and be able to move things across. And then yet when I shared it with my colleagues on projects, they had to do a lot of flipping from long to wide and by classes. And it really, but I could do all that in a few steps in, in R. Cool, that's helpful, thank you. So I really found this a lot better and I shared with Matt earlier in the day and I don't think he's seen it, you know, a script I had on looking at Bobcat home range centers and drawing a common circle around there and use, pulling that up. Excuse me, pulling that out and uh, calculating multiple landscape metrics at different levels all at once and then combining them. So it worked out really, really much nicer. And when I shared that with my colleagues, they were very pleased. That's cool, thank you. Any other questions or um, thoughts from folks? Yeah, I guess I'll just reiterate what Bob said. My motivation for learning the package was to unify my workflow. Um, you know, I do use ArcGIS to digitize and to curate my uh, spatial data, um, but the, the going back and forth uh, between storing data in ArcGIS or Access or whatever, and then putting it into R and going back and forth was a big pain. Um, so in terms of just sort of unifying your workflow and making it reproducible and all of that, um, that was my, my motivation for learning it. And I guess one point that John Key made in a paper in ecology se several years ago now is that if you're going to do landscape metrics on multiple animals and say, using those to, you know, uh, uh, relate that to home range size, you're going to want to use the same size area, same size circle for every animal, even though they might have different home ranges. If you use a different size circle for an animal with had bigger home ranges than one with a smaller one, you're going to get spurious correlation. So it's really important that you pick one size circle and use it for everyone. And you can use multiple, you can compare multiple circles and see which works best. And you know, in the paper by Key, he used 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000 uh, radii circles. 
had, uh, who's able to come up with better ideas with correlations with home range size. Right. It'd be great um, to hear from both of you with or like have a presentation at some point in the future of your using applying this into a system and kind of what questions you're able to ask. And also I, I messaged just um, earlier, Matt, but like that transition of getting data from um, GIS into R and kind of just that process. I think that's something that many people you know, just it would, would benefit from um, so both like a real field example uh, applications and um, and that kind of workflow. So I might tap you all later. Yeah, okay. that's fine. that was my intention for this uh, when I agreed to it six weeks ago or whatever. Um, but this process of switching our versions and package versions, mm -hmm. I have not made it all the way through uh, my code. So it's not fully functional right now, so I didn't have much to share on that end. And and one hint, you know, maybe a pre, you know, pre precursor to a formal seminar is that you want to make sure everything's in the same coordinate system. The uh -huh. coordinate system for NLCD is, you know, Albers, I think, equal area. And most of the time we're collecting data in UTMs. And so you've got to put everything in a common data data frame. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, Matt, this is a great introduction. It's always nice for these to be able to have enough, uh, have the right amount of material so they can still have conversation afterwards. So I think that you hit that perfectly. So. Um, and I guess I'm curious on a broader scale whether we feel like in general, all of these external software are just going away and like are going to be absolutely down the road because they'll just be packages in R. Are there some that are still like critically better individually as software that do one particular thing rather than packages in R? It seems like RTS has some aspects that are like that. Yeah, I, I mean, so I think some of it depends on what you're more comfortable programming in, right? Um, there's more Python users out there than there are mm -hmm. R users. So scripting in GIS might be easier for folks that are familiar with Python. However, the, uh, it seems that uh, in ecology, R is much more popular. So a, a package aimed at ecologists like Fragstats uh, seems like most of their user base might be more comfortable doing those calculations in R, but I don't know. And of course, yeah. any statement about R can or cannot do this is a transient statement because the user base is such that what isn't possible now may well be possible next year. And just as a reminder, our mark is just a interface to mark. And so you have to still have mark on your system. And even though R is able to run on a Mac, Mac mark doesn't. And so you would not be able to use do R mark type uh, population analysis on a Mac very easily because you still have to have mark to do the, the real calculations. Maybe that's true. Matt, <laughs> sorry? Philip. No, go ahead, Philip. No, uh, Matt, so it looks like the graphics are either SP graphics or, or raster, gra raster that's then inheriting from SP. So if you didn't like the color scheme, I assume that all the SP modifications that you can provide would work for um, these functions. Is that is that cor correct, or have you not tried to sort of tweak the graphs? Oh man, um, I did. I did try, <laughs> and it ended up being a big mess. And I don't know if that is user error. Um, that was actually um, that was in uh, in the raster package. Um, context though not not in the uh, landscape metrics i haven't attempted to modify the sort of output rasters from landscape metrics because i often do not like the default color schemes and um in particular for those sort of um image plots um so yeah it, 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 that's where things become more difficult often than they really should be is, is trying to make a graph that you'd be willing to put into a manuscript. Yeah. 
Any other questions or comments? Awesome. Well, uh, thanks very much, Matt, for uh, presenting. It's been really interesting. I recorded it, and then we'll let um, people know that it'll be available for them afterwards. And um, next week, uh, Wade uh, Dismukes is going to present on, uh, wait, I think it's called True Ducking. Um, it's an R package that he that's for nested phylogenies, I think. Um, I'll send out some more information, but uh, it's a package I think he wrote and is, um, yeah, he's going to share with us. So that'll be next week. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Matt. Good job.